So we're going to call this meeting to order at 7.02 and start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> okay, we'll start with the approval of the agenda. Um, if I could get a motion. I need a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Okay, so the agenda is approved. Um, and a motion for approval of open session minutes from April 11, 2016. Motion to approve the open session minutes of April 11, 2016. Second. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. The open session minutes are approved. Um, opening it up to the community. If there are any community comments? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move on to student comments. And we doesn't look like Chris is here tonight. So we'll move right along. This is going to be the speediest meeting ever. <laughs> um, going right over to the superintendent. All right. Well, good evening. Um, you have in your packet, um, and, and I thought I'd apprise you of where we are with regard to kindergarten registration uh, to date. I know uh, in my budget presentation, and as we went through the first pass of the budget, we talked about that being uh, a variable. Uh, Largely going on the NESDAQ projections, which showed a drop in live birth rates from 2010 to 2011. <clears throat> um, at this juncture, I, I'm pleased to say I think we're pretty much at status quo with regard to uh, our kindergarten enrollment of next year versus this year. Okay, as you can see, as the, the chart. Uh, shows as of April 13th, so a little bit more than a week ago, we've got about 79 uh, enrolled potentially at um, Memorial and 71 enrolled at um, Clough. Um, you can see too, and, and, and I think we, uh, a, a lot of kudos goes out to our special <coughs> immersion advisory board and our parent outreach group We've got um, some pretty healthy numbers with regard to uh, the SI uh, enrollees. We've got 24 enrolled uh, for kindergarten at Memorial and 16 enrolled at Clough. Um, as I say in my background notes, I think the ideal would be hopefully we can perhaps equalize those sections. It would be really nice to have something on the order of you know 20-ish in each. So we'll work on that in the coming months, but I thought I'd apprise you exactly where we are. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. Um, okay, so we'll go to happy little thoughts of five-year-olds learning to healthcare insurance. Uh, uh, just as an update, um, we're still in the process of negotiations with Harvard Pilgrim Health. Um, some very mildly positive news. You know, their initial quote to us for renewal was 19.59%. Um, they're now at 17%, still a very, very uh, high renewal rate. Um, we, we're, we've kind of taken a um, wait and see approach. Um, there's generally about a two month lag time from when they have their claims reports. Um, so they put those reports out roughly around the 15th of each month. So we got the January of 2016 claims report um, just on April 15th. Unfortunately, it wasn't very favorable because right now at a 12-month gap, we're at about a 101.5% um, claims ratio, which essentially means they've paid out 1.5% more than they've taken in, in premiums. Um, 
So obviously, you know, our position is the same in, in working with, with NFP, which acts as our agent in dealing directly with Harvard Pilgrim Health. Um, so we're essentially, if, if, if you know anything about the insurance industry, there's um, four major carriers. We've already reached out to Blue Cross Blue Shield for a quote. Um, NFP will also be working with us to reach out to Fallon and Tufts as well. Um, to look at every possible renewal option and hopefully have some leverage as well. So I'll keep you apprised of that, but at this uh, juncture, we're at that 17% increase, which is going to be a challenge for the district, but quite frankly, also a challenge for our employees as well, because that's a very, very high hike. Um, so like I said, I'll keep you apprised of that. And then uh, last but not least, I just I want to give a plug uh, to our students on the NetMoc Student Council who uh, are sponsoring an event known as Warriors Walking for Warriors 5K. It's a run and a walk this coming Saturday. Um, and it starts at 9 o'clock at the high school. Um, the vision is it's very much a family event because they're also going to have numerous activities um, I think they're going to have an inflatable bouncy, an obstacle, of course, face painting, burgers, dogs, and so on. And um, I'm really encouraging everybody to come out because all of their profits are going to go to the Afghanistan Veterans of America organization. So a good cause, a good, great group of students are coming together. Okay? Any questions? Thank you. Okay, um, moving right along to administrator comments. <coughs> Do we, I don't think we have any. Okay. <coughs> um, then passing right along to subcommittee update, Pam, um, policy subcommittee. schools. Sort of discussion. So we're just going moving right along to a vote, right? Correct. Approve? Okay. So if we could get a motion for approval. Make a motion to approve the security plans and schools um, policy. Second. Any discussion? It looks very thorough. Okay, so um, all those in favor say aye. Okay. Aye. Okay, so it passes. Um, policy ECAF. Um, Jay, do you have an update on school lunches, school lunch prices, and styrofoam usage? Um, yes. well, let's start with the styrofoam piece. I, Diane has been trying to get prices for trays just so we know what they cost. It looks to me, based on what we've seen so far, that it's five, say, a thousand trays, which is approximately what we would probably need throughout the district might be $10,000. So it looks like they're about 10 bucks a piece. <clears throat> um, but we're still looking for prices on that. Uh, one of the challenges is we probably ideally would like to pilot this in a school first and see how it goes. Um, the ideal place to pilot it would be the high school because the kids are older and more mature, but it would cost us more to get the dishwasher working at the high school than at Quaker Memorial, where they basically will turn right on. We want it. Nitmock has got some issues and needs to have some repair work. So we're still kind of bouncing around where we want to go or how we want to approach this. So we don't really have a you know, plan in place yet. We're still trying to get cost factors so we can factor. You know, what I'd like to be able to bring to you is it's going to cost this in manpower, going to cost this in maintenance on the appliances, and this is what the upfront cost is to buy trays, and this is what the investment would be to get the program running. What about electricity? Do you think that would make a huge difference? No? Not really? No, not enough to worry about it. Okay. Unless, you know, we're running in like 25 hours, you know, out of the 24-hour day, but I don't think so. <clears throat> we'll have carports and solar power providing power for us. So. <laughs> Um, on the school lunch prices, um, I mentioned this at the policy subcommittee meeting. Um, my recommendation is to raise the price 10 cents a lunch to $2.85. Uh, $2 um, I 
if that buys you about five or six years before you have to address it again. And it kind of keeps us within compliance with the uh, the food, the federal food program and what they think we should be charging. It also brings a little bit more revenue in to help support things like dishwashers and plastic trays and <laughs> additional manpower and that kind of stuff. So um, that would be my recommendation. It's totally up to you guys. So I think I gave you last time your basic options. I think you're going to have to go up five cents no matter what. Okay. I think the last increase we did was 25 cents, believe it or not. I think we went from a buck. Got our 250 to 275, and that was maybe in 2010. Okay. Are we thinking that we're going to vote on this this evening? Or? I think the wise thing to do would be <clears throat> to hold off till May 9th. Okay. That way it's published in the agenda in advance. Okay. In the event that somebody wanted to speak to, them, they would have uh, notice have an in advance. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Jay. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any old business? Can I just make one, just so you guys know, um, our first solar field is operational as of a week ago. So we haven't seen it on our bills yet, but we are now going to be getting solar credits for at least one of the facilities. We should really get a picture of that, yet. I've been working on it. I have a picture of one panel being constructed, but it really is that exciting. <laughs> <clears throat> but we do have one field up and running. So I was kind of happy to hear that after seven years of dealing with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, okay, so under new business, we're going to discuss school start times. And I know Dr. Mushek put together a presentation for some of the details, some of the factors that need to be considered. Jay, can you turn on the uh, smart board, please? <laughs> I'm going to warn everybody that there's the smart board is making a very funny noise. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So Maybe I <laughs> hope that this gets up and running. Otherwise, I'm going to be doing a lot of describing. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm a pretty good describer, but it's yeah. probably better that you have something to look at. I want to use truth in advertising here for my cover. Okay, the picture in the lower right hand corner of the cute little second graders at Memorial, that's a real picture. That's this is Cardamone's kids. The kid in the upper left hand corner, that's really not a student at Milwaukee. It's just a sock photo. Okay, it'd be really rude to <laughs> support a yawning girl. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, to start, why has this become a, a, a topic? A topic not only across the state, but nationally. Um, it really comes down to two reports that have come out in the last two years. One in 2014, uh, a, a, a fairly lengthy policy statement, which I've included in your packet, about school start times and really a national epidemic of adolescents not receiving enough sleep. And then uh, just last August, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, also um, kind of reiterated what the American Academy did as far as considering it to be a public health crisis as far as less and less sleep uh, for adolescents. So um, we probably all know this, but uh, teenagers that are developing need between eight and a half and nine and a half hours per sleep. Uh, hours per sleep. I really wish Chris was here to, in his own inimitable style, <laughs> tell us uh, how much sleep he gets and how much of his peers actually get. But as you can see, uh, the statistics do show from the CDC that two thirds of high school students across the country are getting less than eight hours. So um, what are some of the consequences of sleep loss? Um, I'm sure you're cognizant of all of these, um, but obviously when you don't have enough sleep, it's difficult to pay attention, uh, which leads to obviously deficits in learning and therefore academic achievement. It's also tied to anxiety and depression. Uh, also, there's a lot of uh, research, uh, particularly from the CDC, about with less sleep tends to come uh, unhealthy eating, 
um, and as a result, lack of physical activity and also obesity. And there's also plenty of, of research out there about uh, motor vehicle crashes because of lack of sleep. So I think this is very much common sense, and I think most of us would clearly uh, agree uh, with the American Academy and the CDC have come out with. So in their policy statement, um, they make a series of, I believe, six, five or six common sense uh, recommendations. Uh, one uh, about we need to do more with adolescents and parents regarding sleep needs and optimum sleep hygiene. Um, very strong advocacy for you really need to wind down, okay? Um, I, I thought of you, Diane, when I was reading the policy statement about electronic devices in the bedroom. And, you know, I think about my own teenage daughters with you know, the phone is literally by the bed and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, getting the word out of what leads to a solid night's sleep. Um, again, eliminating factors uh, that contribute to a, a chronic sleep deprivation. Um, and, and really the, the whole piece, and, and this ties into another conversation about homework and about assessments and about reasonableness. Um, that's a whole other separate conversation, but I think that comes into play as well. Um, Getting the word out there of what the effects are on chronic sleep deprivation, um, including short-term and long-term morbidity. Um, I sent as an addendum uh, to the packet uh, about some of the work Ashland is doing right now. They've made a decision to change their start times, but they're intentionally holding off till 17, 18. And they're using a full 18 months to do a lot of work with their parents and the community at large about uh, this issue. And then really the piece that gets all the attention is they didn't pull any punches and they said, look, our recommendation is that all middle schools and high schools should aim for a start time no, uh, no earlier than 8.30. And they also say, you should probably also take into account your bus times and your commute times. And as I will know, um, generally in Menden Upton, we're talking about 45 minutes to a full hour is when our, most of our bus routes start. So, you know, it, it's not uncommon. Our high school kids are getting on the bus upward 6.30, quarter of seven. It's not uncommon, as I'm sure you all know. So, um, with these two reports, we've seen uh, a lot of districts starting to rethink things. And this is a report just from a couple months ago about Newton, which is now in the process of studying this. I feel really like run down, kind of just like drowsy in school, which usually affects my schoolwork. Savannah is a high school sophomore who also works part time after school. She could lose cash if Newton begins the school day later, but there are good reasons to make a change. Yeah, when kids don't get enough sleep, if they they're, if it adversely affects their emotions, so they they become much more volatile in their emotions. Dr. Seidler says more sleep means better mental and physical health and improved school performance. It's important that schools don't start at 7, 7.30 in the morning, because they just can't get enough sleep. It's under study in Newton schools. Making a start time change is complicated for a lot of logistical and financial reasons. There's a lot at stake. Extracurricular activities, sports, the arts, minute student employment, um, family concerns. They don't have as much time to work because it conflicts with homework, their sleep, and it sort of pushes the pendulum back the other way. Newton Shoe Barn employs teens as part-timers, a help to business and a good first job. And when my alarm goes off and I end up sleeping for an extra half an hour, I feel more ready for the rest of my day. I think on average I get about five hours of sleep. I personally don't think that we should um, start school any later. No decisions are made yet, but with health as the key issue, it seems likely in years to come, Newton teens could hear that school bell ring just a little later. In Newton, I'm Pam Cross, WCBB News 5.
So um, that highlights new in me. No, actually, I, and, and I think Lee actually attended the MASC, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, had a meeting in Newton on uh, start times very recently, right? A couple yes. weeks ago? Yeah. So um, something to keep in mind is, believe it or not, three quarters of all high schools in the Commonwealth do start before 730, including us. Okay. Um, but there's a totally non-inclusive list of schools that are studying it and looking at implementation in either 17 or 18 to a later start time for their high schools. And the, uh, one that's gotten a lot of attention is the Middlesex League. It's basically that cluster kind of heading up towards the North Shore right off 128. So, you know, your Arlington, your Burlington, your Lexington. They've kind of agreed, all the superintendents and the high school principals, along with their school committees, to study it collectively. Um, you've got some other districts that have recently, in the last two to four years, have moved their start times for the high school somewhere in the 8 to 8.30 range. Um, and then, as I said, and, and I think I gave you the memo in the packet, Ashland has recently announced that the high school is going to transition to an 8.30 start time. I think they're in the ballpark of around 7.30 um, this school year. So um, where are we in Menden Upton? You can see our, our start and finish times. You can see our elementaries start at a very civil time at 9.15. Um, so does the middle school starting at 8.25. It's just really the high school at 725, um, which would be um, a time that is earlier than the APA uh, recommendations. Um, so what are the challenges? I, I, I think you heard a little bit of it uh, in that snippet on Newton. Um, right now, we run three tiers of busing. You know, starting with the high school, then the middle school, and then the elementary. So conceivably, could you say, okay, we're going to go down to two tiers and maybe make the high school and the middle school at the same start time? Potentially, you're looking at additional costs for busing um, if you were to add more buses. Um, you know, I, I, I think the reality is we're stuck in a system that the foundation quite frankly, is in the 19th century, and it's based on an agrarian system that we want the older kids to come home and work in the fields and take care of the little ones. But there is still a certain reality of high school kids getting home first, looking after their younger siblings, and so on. So if we were to shift any school time, you're talking about a paradigm shift, particularly with regard to um, child care arrangements and responsibilities. Um, particularly at the high school, there's the issue of after-school athletics and the times that our contests begin. Um, we beat it. I'm just going to have to do a little describing. Um, and then, you know, we do have a fairly decent amount of kids at the high school who have after-school employment, so that's an issue. Um, I also put contractual obligations. Our start times and finish times for our schools are uh, detailed in our contracts. And then I, I would say just the change process in general, that you know, you're changing a very, very well-established paradigm. And you know, as you know, change is always a difficult thing for all stakeholders. So uh, my last slide, which is just an absolutely brilliant slide, and I'm, I'm sad, I'm deeply sad that you can't see it. Uh, I don't know. Um, but essentially, I, I, I think the essential question is, should the district establish some type of study committee to look at what the stakeholders want? Um, I find it, oh, there it is right there. Um, 
it's kind of interesting. You can go online and find a ton of districts across the state that um, have started this process within the last few months. One of the districts, Malden, they did a pretty comprehensive survey um, with all stakeholders, staff, kids, parents, and they pretty, and particularly at the high school, which starts at like 715, they all pretty much said 65, 70% were completely content with our start and finish time. So I think that's in the realm of possibility. I know, John, you, know, you have an anecdote to report with regard to the mock town meetings sure, that yeah. were done. Kelly and Jay can certainly have into this conversation too. We ran two mock town meetings during our 21st century learning conference that they facilitated for us, a junior and a senior. And on the warrant in both of those meetings was should we change the start time? And I think it was presented to the kids as either 7.30, 7.25, 7.30, what we have now, or move to a block with the elementary. So it would be that much of a later 9.15 starting time. I expected the kids, because I, well, I hold the doors in the morning, and I see them coming in drowsy, oftentimes clutching a coffee. I'm doing the same. I expected them to jump all over the change. And there was some reluctance. Uh, they value their after school time. They are very busy young people. They have jobs. They participate in sports. And so and then we discussed it also with school council, which is teachers and parents and students, and the same, reached the same conclusion that if it were a flip-flop of elementary and high school start times, there was some concern about a loss of after school time, whether it's earning, child care, or extracurricular activities. You, anything you want to add from being part of those discussions? Yeah, but you were the moderator. Right? I was the moderator for that. Yeah, it was an interesting conversation. It's too bad Chris isn't here because Chris was very adamant that we should switch it. Uh -huh. But the thing that got said the most was if kids got to sleep later, they would just stay up later. They're not going to get any more sleep. They're just going to go to bed an hour later and sleep an hour later. It would all be the same. And they would lose out on their work time. Chris's argument was, we'll get up and go to work before you go to school. So he was all gone cold about it. Um, <laughs> But I was actually quite surprised. I would say it was probably pretty much overwhelmingly the kids were not interested in switching the start time. I think what we had on the warrant was 7.30 or 9 o'clock. We kind of arbitrarily picked the time. Um, we didn't give them much of, you know, they could have amended it because they did that with a couple others, but they didn't seem interested. Yeah, I would, I would start with what these two just said about, they, they were concerned about the after school activities, walking especially. Um, because I think that anyone that plays sports would know that that would be accommodated if, if there was to be changes in the morning schedule. But I was surprised. I really, I really thought they, like John just said, they'd jump at the chance to sleep an hour later. But they got up and they said, if you're going to let us sleep an hour later, we're just going to go to bed an hour. We're just going to go bed an hour later as well. So the same amount of time, but still, they'd still be spent sleeping. Now oh, that's interesting because at the mass meeting I went to, several studies were cited by a parent who is a doctor um, who lives in Newton um, that says first the brain science indicates that kids about the age of puberty cannot go to bed really and sleep well before 11 p.m. Um, and additionally, delaying start times doesn't equal staying up later. Several studies have shown that it actually doubles the amount of kids getting at least eight hours of sleep a night. So although anecdotally people may say that that's the science doesn't support that. So that's just, you know, when you look at the, the science of this, it's incontrovertible. There, there's no reason scientifically not to do this. It's a matter of logistics oftentimes. You know, the, that's where the details um, have to be ironed out if it's something we, we choose to do. So we can, you know, it's definitely a, a large conversation that has to be had before. You know, discussions are made, there, but the science does support, you know, later start times for kids. Um, and additionally, that sleeping in on on the weekends that kids do gives them almost the same effect as jet lag. So it takes them three days to get back into, um, you know, a, a, a regular sleep cycle. So when they binge sleep on the weekends, that's also adding to the issues. Um, you know, additionally, athletes are 1.7 times more likely to have sports injuries if they get less than eight hours of sleep. So many times when we need to bring the athletic staff into the conversation, sometimes statistics like that. Okay. All right, 
day, I have the names of videos, I have lots of, lots of info, <laughs> and contact people if you need more. And I would say, too, not to jump in, but I have anecdotes that support the reasons that a familiar start time would be good for kids, whether it's uh, seeing the same student sign one tardy mm -hmm. often, or knowing that the classrooms are much quieter at 7.30 as opposed to the very end of the day. Teachers are working hard to get kids engaged and active mm -hmm. when they're coming in with, you know, I think five hours of sleep is probably a good estimate. Last year we did some work in advisory um, surveying kids about the amount of sleep that they got. It was around five hours on average that they were getting to just not get enough rest. And we're asking a lot of them, because I was leaving to come over to this meeting tonight, kids were getting ready for jazz band, so they either ran home or stayed through, and so they had a full school day two, three hours of jazz band rehearsal, a couple hours of homework in between. They're not going to go right to bed when they get home. They're going to be up for a while. So it's a concern of mine. I feel like it has such a long-term cumulative effect on them. By the time June comes around, we hear all the time from parents. The kid started summer vacation and immediately got sick. If they're worn out, as soon as there's a break, they end up getting sick and vulnerable. I think it's, um, in some of the articles that you gave to us, Joe, Clear that this isn't. This is only one piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. There's an education for everybody to learn about what the negative effects of sleep deprivation are. But this is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, but it's it's interesting to hear your anecdotal John that kids are coming in with their coffee and really tired. And you know, I think I don't know. This is just my own observation. I felt like I was busy when I was in high school but it doesn't compare to the level of busy that I see these kids today engaging in. It's much more difficult versus back in the day when we were in school. Yeah, and, and I felt like I was a pretty easy. busy person. And now I look at these kids and like, you know, if you're doing athletics, you're practicing every single day or you have a competition. Mm -hmm. And then there are the kids who go right to after school um, jobs and again, they still have homework to do. I'd like to believe what you said, Lee, that, that if you give them an extra hour in the morning, it doesn't mean that they're going to stay up an extra hour, because that's great mm -hmm. if they are able to actually truly get that extra hour of sleep, because much like that girl said, an, an extra half an hour, an extra hour can make all the difference. But I think a task force is a great idea to start to investigate this. And the other thing that kind of, like I, I know pragmatically, this is gonna create a ton of issues, mm -hmm. especially childcare issues. Like if I just look at it from my own perspective in my family, like what I'm relying on right now to make my life work, I know it, it would require a lot of rearranging. So I, I don't see this as something that's feasible for the next school year, but perhaps the 17, 18 school year. And if people get, I mean, change is inevitable anywhere. If people get enough of notice and know what they need to prepare for, mm -hmm. and it's better for kids, I think we should be doing it. But not even because the students, I mean, like like you said, I, I touch base with my high school students, and they're like, "No way! I don't want to start later." I, I've got, I've got sports. I've got this. I've got that. I've been, there's good amount of they have in the, the day, so it's going to be um, uh, a huge educational campaign. If this is, a, we definitely want to um, study this and get feedback from all stakeholders. But um, I think there's something about education that goes into this because it is a huge part of change. Absolutely. I mean, it would be difficult for me. Yeah, I can personally say it, it would be a huge change, and I have to change my plans, of course, you know, everybody's got their own situation. Everyone's going to be in their own, um, their own shift that has to happen within their families. But it's definitely, I mean, when you hear the studies, you can't ignore it. And if you also think about how their performance could possibly be enhanced in schools, and that they have even a more productive experience in schools, I mean, that's what's well, there's a lot of research out there, too, that I'm sure you have, that shows the effect of, like, tardiness goes down by a third almost mm -hmm. immediately, the um, car crashes are cut in half. Mm -hmm. So there's so much research on the, the effects already that they know about. 
And a lot of those risk-taking behaviors that oftentimes lead into other behavioral problems and things yeah. like that are also yeah. quite quickly. Absolutely. John, they didn't make an amendment to their um, mock. No. They didn't. I think it. I think if they had, they would have moved it to, you know, because I think it was 9 o'clock, yeah. so I think that was a little late. So well, that's I think, what I was wondering. I think if there was to be an amendment, they might have moved it up, but I don't know if it really would have convinced We may not have explained that they could make amendments at that point yet. <laughs> In your viewpoint as the high school principal, if you had your druthers, what would be the ideal start time, given all the factors? Um, I think listening to the kids and hearing that 9 o'clock is too late and trying to find a compromise, I think 8 15 can make a considerable difference for our kids. Mm -hmm. Being get a little more rest. You mentioned it with the bus routes. Kids who are going out to catch a bus at 6 30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. That is an early, early start. It's dark in the winter, too. Yeah. <laughs> just, a, just from a different perspective, like for any kid who has to walk to a bus stop, which my children do. It's dark. I think, I think <laughs> that would um, mitigate the interest of the employers. I think they'd be willing to work with kids and it allow them to start their shift a little bit later. They need the help as well, and they would work with the school in that regard. I think from an athletic standpoint, you wouldn't have that many complications. We start our soccer games at 4 o'clock already anyway, right. and there are 3.30 starts for other games, but that could be managed, but especially with our league. We're also close to each other. So I think finding that middle ground and letting our kids a little more sleep at night would be a really good thing. So in addition, when you're talking about education plan, it's better to focus because they're more aware too of not just changing the hours, paying the hours, but the quality of sleep as well, you know, um, so that it's more beneficial and restful. Things like not engaging in screen time or television. Why do you go to sleep with a TV on? Mm -hmm. The blue light just interferes with sleep. And like we talked about with just an educational campaign, there's so many different factors. This is just one small piece of the puzzle that could potentially help in a lot of different areas, as you just pointed out. Not necessarily just educationally, but with you know um, accidents related to driving and um, risky behaviors, depression, different things. So there's a lot of there's a lot of to be gained. Right? By getting these kids more sleep. To check in one more time, sorry. The push of our wellness week has been to increase kids' awareness of mindfulness <coughs> and how they can support their health by being aware of things that they took for granted. It's just the way I live. This is when I get up. This is what I eat. This is why I exercise. But to give them some strategies on how to um, gain control over those aspects of their lives. When I hear about communities taking 18 months to educate parents and kids and teachers and administrators. That's really exciting to me because I agree with you. This is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, but we recognize that our kids are vulnerable and sleep is one part of it. But the more we can do to support their not only the a structure, the logistics that support their health and well being, but provide the education that can support the better our and I think if we start off with that education piece, talking about the quality of sleep and how to get better sleep and give parents an opportunity to really figure out how they're going to make this work in their lives. Because again, like you said, Joe, this was based on an agrarian lifestyle and things shift. It's funny that this has lasted as long as it has in some respects. Yeah. But everybody gets used to change. It's just good to give people some, you know, some time to adapt to the change and um, to make plans to accommodate the change. But I think we should, at a bare minimum, start with an education piece. Jay? The only thing I'd offer is I think the biggest challenge to this is going to be managing your busing. I mean, educating people, all the good things are all great, but you've got to figure out a way to manage your bus routes so that you don't double your cost of transportation. Um, we run three routes right now, we pay by the day, but to cut that down to say two runs instead of three runs, you're going to increase the quantity of buses, which means you're going to be paying another 300 some odd dollars per day per bus, yeah. based on whatever the contract ends up at that point. That is the biggest challenge, I think, in any of this, is how you manage your routes and your transportation so that you can make it all work within the three different you know, levels of school. Yeah. 
We used to be a two tier system. So no, we were smaller though. We, we just did that made the difference. Too. Well, we only had two schools. We had uh, this we had building. Three, and, the two elementaries and then this building. Yeah. You know, it would be easy to have kids be on the same bus that go to this school as good Lord Clough. It's three minutes down the road. It doesn't work with Memorial in this school, it works with Memorial in Nipmuc, but you're not gonna have Memorial kids on the bus with the high school kids. Just thinking out loud the world, you know. And, and again, it's not coming up with a solution, it's just a thought off the top of my head. Um, again, it's not a solution, but it's Say you have the high school and the middle school on the same schedule and you have the same basic bus route the the talk and i think this has come up at the school committee level about well gee why is the bus only half full and why is the bus only have three or four kids on it and so on the challenging thing is realize when we create the routes we're planning a seat for every single kid up but oftentimes you have a situation where the parents are driving so the conundrum is, you know, is there a way potentially that you could have bus routes that are realistic in accounting for kids that are actually taking the bus on a daily basis? You know, I, I think that's going to be a tremendous challenge. Well, any type of, I know this is just the, the very beginning stages of this, but would it be of any use to survey? Parents as to oh, I think who's, so. who's driving and who's consistently taking the bus, um, just to kind of get the if if, if parents are committed to driving their student their, their children to school every day, that typically doesn't change very much. I know my my son does school every day, yeah. you, know, you know, because he's not going to get up at six thirty and catch the bus, <laughs> um, but. Some people want to drive their kids to school mm -hmm. and they don't want them to take the bus. So if, yep. we, if we had an idea of what parents really don't really care to have their kids on the bus and the parents that are, you know, sending their kids on the bus. But do we have to have a spot? We're required everything? to have a spot for every student. Oh, we are. So it doesn't matter, even if a parent said, I will absolutely not yeah. be putting my child on the what bus. What if the car the breaks down have. someday and they decide that, you know what, you're going to have to take the bus today yeah. because my car's in the shop. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to, you know, that doesn't mean they won't, but you have to have the group on the bus. And typically the way it is now, the thing is the high school routes are like half full at that or less because a lot yeah. of high school kids drive. Right. But, you know, you don't have a system where you could actually say, all right, you pay a fee to take the bus, so you, you get there on your own, and then you'll have more exact numbers. So you're kind of stuck with some of that. There's a little bit of fluid, you know, fluidity to how many seats you have to provide because, you know, some kids are just not going bus every day but you do have to have a seat available for any kid that wants to take the bus on any given day right. and you may not know that until that day right that makes it tricky yeah very. that makes it very tricky like i said i think that's the challenge to this is figuring out your roots and stuff you know as joe said you know could you have middle school and high school start at the same time and logistically you know yeah you could have kids from Menden. they come here it's on the line they drop kids off here they go to nitmark the the opposite would be the case in Upton. They're going to pick up kids, go to Nitmuck, and then come here. So now you're crossing back and forth. And what I did learn over the summer, I tried to see if there was a way to eliminate one of the SI buses that takes the kids to clock just because it's expensive. So I decided one day I would go drive the route, just drive the entire route to every stop that we had made for. It took me an hour and 25 minutes to go to every place in Upton because it's, you know, either they lived in Grafton, Upton, or they lived in Milford Upton. <laughs> Or they, you know, it's like everywhere. I couldn't believe how long it took to drive that whole route. <laughs> That's crazy. But I think that will be part of the conversation if we can form a committee mm -hmm. to really start investigating this. You know, that's not something that I'm super aware of, but, you know, Joe mm -hmm. is and tells Stone. We can crunch the numbers to figure out what could be feasible. Definitely. Any other discussion? Okay. Do we have any correspondences? We do not. Okay. Um, any other matters not anticipated by the committee within 48 hours of the posted meeting? Okay. Um, future agenda items include the approval of the Mercy Technology Plan on May 9th, 
presentation of um, Cox Sync software on May 9th and the Golden Apple Award on June 20th. Um, so without any further ado, we have a motion to adjourn. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned at 747. Wow. Have a good time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.